session. Uh, our last session is decentralization. Um, I think this is this is going to be uh, an interesting conversation because ENS has been progressing, you know, gradually and, and measurably towards less and less admin rights, but V2 with L2s is necessarily going to involve moving some of the architecture to systems that still have upgrade, you know, escape hatches and so forth, unless we wait, you know, an extended period. And, and even then, it, this kind of resets the clock a little bit in that, you know, our process so far has been to build stuff, deploy it with some degree of DAO upgradability uh, or, you know, pre-DAO with, with multi-sig upgradability and sort of let it cook for a bit, you know, observe the system, uh, make sure that we're happy with its operation before we lock things down and remove that level of human control. And necessarily going to a V2 is going to involve doing that all over again to a degree. And so I'm really interested to hear everyone's input on on how we can make that timeline as, as quick as practical and also how we can uh, minimize the, the admin access, the admin rights and so on as we go uh, so that we're not basically reverting to an earlier state of ENS in order to get these technical upgrades. Anyone want to dare to be first? Amazing. Hello, my name is Prem, and I am um, with Thomas. Uh, we are Unruggable, and uh, I just had this simple uh, topic, which is Unruggable versus Upgradable. I find this to be uh, one of the, uh, the primary tensions with the ENS, uh, is continuing to think about these two uh, factors and how they interact together, and of course, why ENS needs to be both. Uh, this goes to a little bit what uh, Nick was speaking about, which is that we have uh, different levels of unruggability for our different uh, components of the protocol. So we start with clients. Uh, when it comes to clients, we basically use a kind of decentralized social consensus or just the consensus of the clients uh, you know, and the users who are using the clients. And that means like wallets. Uh, as Thomas said before, we trust our wallets basically, because they could just return whatever results they want to us when we, want, when we put in an ENS name. Um, but that is a form of decentralization, because you can always use a different wallet if you don't like the wallet you're using. Um, the L1 registry, obviously, is going to be the highest level of uh, decentralization and, and unruggability, because uh, I only leave 10% for bugs, because if a bug rugs you, um, that is a bug, but, and that is a rugging. But it's not, um, there really isn't any uh, Thing on the ENS side that uh, makes, uh, makes it ruggable. Um, then we have the new design, which is the L2.eth uh, registry. So we're going to have a registry on the L2. And the reason why I put it at the lower level there is because of the DAO. So this low level, uh, I think I put it at 25%, is the idea of DAO control. And uh, we do have admin um, of the L2 registry because of the gateway. We need to maintain the path from L1 to L2, and therefore this is a gateway that uses the off-chain resolver, and it, it, it really isn't any way to like burn the relationship between L2, L1 and L2, um, like burn the, the admin control there, because we have a URI that we're using, and it's just not possible. Um, then we have the idea of renewals. Renewals is obviously a way to rug users, because if you're, uh, you register a name, you've had it for a couple of years, and then all of a sudden you want to re-register, and then all of a sudden it costs a million dollars. It's implausible, but at the same time, it is a, a ruggability vector. Um, then we also have gateways. Gateways are also pretty high in terms of the uh, unruggability because we have proofs. Uh, of course, the timing on, on the finality is an issue, but we do have proofs, and therefore it's pretty high. I leave a little bit left because gateways can censor. 
So they're not quite as high as the L1 uh, contracts uh, registry. Uh, then we have the universal resolver. And I've just stuck it in, in two different colors because we have this idea of deploying the universal resolver with uh, it upgradeability uh, built into the universal resolver to facilitate the um, migration. Uh, at some point, there is the potential to burn the, um, the uh, upgrade uh, ability of the universal resolver, at which time you would have uh, L1 uh, security on that. Um, I do think that there's... Uh, some complexity with that. Nick and I have talked about that a bit. Uh, I think we, we disagree on this, uh, on quite a few things on this issue, but uh, it is an important part of the protocol, the universal resolver. And I think I'd just like to bring attention to it, if nothing else, uh, in that way. I just skip all the details because of time. But when it comes to subnames, I think there's some other interesting considerations because I do think we're gonna be moving towards a world where subnames become very important. And I'm imagining something like um, uh, you know, base, having base.eth, I've heard that they might be interested in doing something with that. And um, <clears throat> we do get a new level of sub, uh, which is the sub registry of the actual name, the base name it itself has a sub registry. And in this case, I put it in two colors because I do see the idea um, of it being centralized, which is like the lowest level if you have like the, the almost 0% uh, uh, that's centralized. And that is because uh, the, the registry of the name, the base name itself, could be changed anytime by the owner of base. Um, and I make two two tone because I do think that, oh, because of the uh, mechanism, which would be to, uh, there is the possibility of burning that, uh, and that is something that uh, is in the protocol. But at the same time, um, I'm not sure how many people will do that, and I think that'll be a lot of discussion around that. And it might be at some point that you actually use DAO control of that registry update. So therefore, there could be some sort of so, uh, DAO level control for that registry update. That's why I think that it might end up being at the 25% mark. And then renewals is, is another problem where uh, you have basically centralization if you wanted to have subnames have a registration fee. Um, so I, it, I have more slides, which I don't I exactly have time for, but uh, we could talk more about the details on all these issues in terms of looking at the lowest uh, level of ruggability. I think that's very important because a lot of times if you work on one area, you might be spending a lot of time and there's actually a low point in the ruggability that affects the whole protocol, but it's not getting the same attention as something else which like, uh, might be, in terms of the protocol, might actually be a weakest link uh, in there. Uh, any questions on either subnames or the L2 uh, uh, units with uh, the second level names and like these ruggability vectors, particularly the universal resolver, if anybody has any questions about that? Yeah, maybe one question. I have the feeling that most of the resolver at the moment that are live in production are not always uh, like checking back the, the proof, right? Like you you resolve the name on L2, and then you are, you are supposed to wait for fi finality on L1, and then check the, the storage proof against the um, storage uh, slot that is uh, anchor on L1, and I have, you have the feeling that is not the case, uh, at least for some of uh, the implementation that I saw. So just wanted to know if, one, that's uh, already your impression, and if yes, why, uh, like, here, like, the level of unruggability uh, doesn't match this? Because if you are not checking the proof, obviously, you are introducing, like, a risk factor into the, uh, the equation. Yeah, in this one, we, we assume that we're always checking the proof. Okay. So, b basically, uh, ENS, as it's envisioned, would always be based upon, like, the protocol, the ENS protocol. It does include off-chain resolution. But that's almost like an addition to the protocol, whereas the, the core ENS protocol is, is definitely about um, uh, unruggable, provable uh, values. The, the reason I'm asking is but because most of them are not, if uh, you are on an optimistic rollup, most of them are not waiting seven days before uh, being able to resolve. So they are not uh, waiting for the finality. Right, so that's kind of my point of putting this chart up is to show you that like, even if you're, you, you have this ruggability vector, 
which is the idea of fast finality, there might be somewhere else in the protocol where you have a much greater ruggability vector. So I, I think it just brings in the idea of context that it's an uneven uh, pattern when it comes to ruggability. And I think it should be, we should always keep that, be aware of that, that it's like, you might be concerned about one area, but there might be another area which actually is the weaker link. Just a, a general point that I'm curious as to other people's opinions on is um, the universal resolver in the context of the specification for V2. I'm curious as to other people's opinions on that. Um, as I see it, that's essentially uh, helper functions um, for client integrations. And I personally don't believe that that should be part of the specification um, and part of the protocol. I'm curious what other people think about that. Sorry, can you say again, helper functions, you see? Um, the universal resolver that you proposed whereby it could be upgraded and then that would potentially be turned off. Uh, if uh, someone that was completely new, uh, new to ENS wanted to build on top of this V2, my perception is that they would read the documentation and there would be various contracts deployed that they would interface with. Um, but uh, as I understand, the universal resolver would uh, delegate calls to version one or version two as appropriate and things like that. Um, I'm not sure that should necessarily be the, the case. Um. So, so my own view is that the specs will always define the canonical way to resolve an ENS name in, in full and that the universal resolver is an implementation of that. But in practice, we expect practically everyone to use that implementation because it absolves you of the need to implement it all in each client and so forth. Um, in terms of upgradability, my preferred route would be that we publish immutable versions of the universal resolver um, that implement a particular version of the ENS protocol. Um, that specifically for the transition, we offer clients the option of a, an upgradable universal resolver proxy that currently points at V1 uh, that the DAO can upgrade to point it to V2 on changeover day and then burn the keys for. So it would not be indefinitely, repeatably upgradable by the DAO. It would be a way for clients to seamlessly transition to V2 and accept that, that level of trust until that happens. Personally, I, it would be an option to have a proxy that gets upgraded to point to each new revision of ENS. Personally, I would rather minimize the number of, of resolution, breaking resolution changes we make, and I would rather make them more difficult than less in some ways, because it would, uh, I don't want us to step into that situation where it's very easy to just say, oh, well, you know, just a minor revision to the protocol and so on. Um, I think that, you know, upgrades, changes to the resolution process and therefore to the universal resolver should be on a par with like ENS registry upgrades, not quite that high, but close. And that it should require social consensus to make these changes rather than just technical, you know, DAO vote consensus. And then my question is, so you're saying it's not part of the protocol then, the idea that, that clients have to check the universal resolver? Uh, no, I would say that the protocol is the protocol is defined in the docs. You could implement your own universal resolver. You could do it all via the client and via RPC calls if you wanted. But the universal resolver is provided as a canonical implementation that does it all for you, except for CCIP read. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, I think the the most important part of it being like part of the um, the design of the V two protocol is is that. Um, initial mutability to smoothen out the transition process. Like it's super duper important that at the same time, everyone stops using ENS v1 and starts using ENS v2. Like any application sh like needs to do that pretty much. Um, and so to define that within the specification and have it very clearly laid out of um, what it'll do, then that gives us the ability to or the DAO the ability to make that switch um, and be sure that every application that cares essentially um, is going to have that transition there without them needing to take any action. But beyond that, um, yeah, there's no there's no points for like 
extra mutability. And as Nick was saying, we don't, we don't want extra mutability on the universal resolver. Like generally, we just want a static contract that's not upgradable. And then via social consensus, if there are any changes with the universal resolver, people can upgrade uh, their client, like change the, the contract address. And there are, there are other options available to us for planning the upgrade to be seamless. Uh, you know, we could approach this like a hard fork. You know, we can have a universal resolver sort of proxy that is hard coded to resolve to ENSV1 before block X and ENSV2 after block X. And we can ask all the clients to upgrade to pointing to that well in advance. Um, much like any hard fork, that means that any changes to the time timing have to be coordinated across everyone and require a certain degree of uh, advance notice, but it means there's no potential there for like a DAO hostile attack that upgrades it to some other uh, contract entirely. Yeah, I guess in the context of decentralization, um, it feels like if we're going to these clients and these wallet providers and they're all interfacing with this contract um, and uh, we, we do turn off the upgradability of it and there is a fundamental bug, then it's not decentralized. Um, and if we're in a position whereby we can then reach out to the clients and say to them, hey, actually there was a bug and we've turned this off, can we change this? Again, not, not decentralized. Um, why, why do you say that's not decentralized? Well, if you can ask people to, to change it at will kind of thing. I mean, the fact you have to ask is what makes it decentralized. The fact they can say no is what makes it decentralized. Well, I would just say that in terms of the implementation, it's centralized because that's, that's fine. But because I had proposed earlier and we had debated a bit, the idea of letting clients uh, use their own internal representations, which could even be off-chain. Because uh, theoretically, we're, it should helper contracts, so therefore the helper could be used or could not be used. But I think we agree, you said that that's possible. It can be used or cannot be used. Yeah, I think on the whole, I don't see a lot of compelling reasons for clients to choose to opt out, but they have the freedom to do so if they want to. Um, I, if anyone has any uh, uh, comments around subnames, if anybody's interested in doing a subname project and wants to talk about the rotability of that, I'm very interested in that. Um, actually, I wonder how you would approach reverse resolution when it comes to ENSV2. I think at the moment the solution is to have the registry. Registering has cer certain namespace that can be queried to resolve the name for a certain address. And in V2, it's proposed to have a subname registry on L2 as on uh, ES chain as well, right? Um, however, if we say, like, for example, on base, they have on register, isn't it a bit difficult to? have two chains basically for one entity to register a subdomain registration at the reverse record? Uh, so the, the plan at present, uh, independent of L2, is that there will be a reverse registry on each EVM compatible chain, uh, and there will f additionally be a default reverse registry, which will either exist on L1 as, as, as is, or with EVM, uh, ENS L2 can be put on that chain. Um, Anyone can uh, can sign a message uh, from their EVM account claiming that their primary name is X and submit that to the default reverse registry. Um, and then the resolution process, this is done internally to the resolver, so it doesn't need to be implemented explicitly by clients, will uh, fall back to that signed message if no, if the specific chain you're resolving a primary name for doesn't doesn't have a record specifically. The reason to use a signed message here is that it makes it impossible, deliberately so, for smart contracts to, to claim a default name since they only exist on, e on specific chains. But that would also mean that every chain, every big, bigger rollup has their own reverse register defined by ENS. Yes. Oh, right. Okay. Yep. So each, each EVM compatible chain will have at least a basic ENS deployment, which consists of a registry hierarchy um, and a reverse registrar. Yeah, that's, I think it's really great because then it's not, they don't have to leave the ecosystem in order to operate or call the name. Yeah. Yeah. Are there, is there anyone else planning on uh, implementing a sub name project and interested in uh, the unruggability of those sub name projects? I, to me, that is a very vital and important part of ENS is to figure out how, for instance, uni.eth becomes 
unruggable versus the current centralized uh, ruggable system they have now. And I think it is vital to ENS to uh, address those issues. And there are some um, design considerations there. Yeah, I mean, I'm from Tyco, and so that, that's why I came to the the, um, the talk here because um, we want to implement a, a subdomain ENS, so like a a dot Tyco or dot ENS dot Tyco. Um, maybe that would be a question: Is would either be possible, or is one preferred, or is one the canonical way of doing that? Um, can you speak to that? Uh, I think at, at present there are a number of different subname providers, um, mostly focusing around CCIP read, uh, well, all focusing around CCIP read, mostly around EVM gateway related infra, uh, several of them around this table. Uh, I'm sure if you make yourself known, they will swarm you like a pack of piranhas and you know discuss with you. <laughs> Perfect, I'll um, be the, the fish bait. I, I'm aware we're sort of running short of time. I did want to sort of do a bit of a vibe check on, on how people feel about uh, acceptable trade-offs. Um, and so, so first of all, like thinking about uh, name resolution. So particularly like imagine an ENS v2, uh, we have our own EVM compatible chain. Uh, people register name, dot ETH na names, second level names on this chain. Um, and we have to have some sort of default for the infrastructure in terms of uh, where we look for proofs and what sort of proofs we're willing to accept for resolution. Um, going from the one extreme to the other, uh, who here would view it as mandatory that the default is L1 finality plus L2 finality, i.e. pretty much 100% guaranteed that uh, the, you know, the, the change is valid and irreversible no matter what state level resources you have? Okay, so no fundamentalists in the audience. Um, who would view it as acceptable to, or, or ma minimum mandatory would be L2 finality plus, say, uh, an exchange level, you know, 20 plus L1 blocks in order to, to accept a change as, as valid for resolving the name? Yeah, so, so perhaps, it, perhaps it would help me to help if I, I went through the possibilities, the extremes. Uh, so at one extreme, we can refuse to resolve a, uh, the, the state we rely on can be only both L1 and L2 are finalized. Um, that's the most secure option. It basically means that it's effectively impossible for anyone to, to give a false result. No, you know, no gateway can lie to you, no matter, how, even if they coordinate with the sequencer and the gateway and you know, a state level act of, the, you know, of, of resources to, to forge blocks and so forth. The next level down is, L2 is finalized, but some number of L1 blocks, ranging from like one up to what your typical exchange accepts, you know, 20 or 40 or whatnot. Um, and the next level down from that would really be um, just uh, L2 is, is non-finalized, but you have some, some degree of certainty that it's not gonna be reverted. Um, and L1 is also not finalized. Uh, and then the lowest of the low is like, somebody signed a pinky promise that this is this is an accurate resolution. So put, put your hands up if this is the lowest level you would, you would be willing to accept. Uh, who here would only be willing to accept both L1 and L2 finality for typical default resolution cases? It, it's the least you would accept. Yeah. Okay, so is the least you would accept L2 finality plus say 40 L1 blocks? Okay, one, two, three. Uh, I'm just like typical exchange, like Kraken or whatever would say 40 blocks, you know, for, for your deposit. So my theory is, you know, start there. Okay, what about L2 finality plus say 10 L1 blocks? Yeah. Um, L2 finality plus one L1 block. Surprising number of people yeah, it means it's, it's mined, yeah. Okay, uh, L1 and neither L1 nor L2 finalized, but committed. Okay, pinky promise. 
<laughs> no. So it's, it, it, it feels like there's a surprise. Sorry. It, it's a is it possible to have a pinky promise with like slashing, uh, like penalized? Like that's like the um, restaking approach as well, right? Is that possible? That's fair. Um, I mean, who here would be happy with a signature bound by a, a slashable bond? So for, again, for default. Definitely, yeah, and, and probably the way to do that would be that we would do one first lookup, and again, this increases your latency and difficulty, but you could do one first lookup on L1 plus L2 finalized state to see what, what value they set for their variable of like what level of finality am I happy to accept. So changing that variable would take the full finality period, but you could change it to say like, I'm okay with just confirmed, you know. Um, but I fully expect most people will not adjust this value, so we need to be relatively conservative about choosing it. And it does seem like, based on my fairly poorly constructed poll, that there is a general consensus around the area of L2 is finalized and L1 has at least confirmed that block, which personally I don't think is a totally unreasonable threshold. You could theoretically, reversing that or giving false results for that would require collaborating between the gateway and an L1 block producer who stands to lose tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars for lying on, on a few seconds worth of resolution results. So it was just kind of to add to that, um, I think, uh, I know that we're mainly engineers here, I think, um, but for these sorts of considerations, thinking in terms of the user experience, which I know we don't have time to go into today, but I think it's an important consideration. So, you know, if someone's registering their first DNS name and they want to think in terms of how quickly before they can send funds to that address or if they update it. And of course, we, we want to have sensible defaults and that level of configurability is important. But I do think that's an important side too, because there's, you know, there, there's, there's lots of other name services spinning up. ENS has got that lovely position of being, you know, first move, it's got the first mover advantage and so on. But I think these kind of more onboarding new user centric considerations are quite important. And with that kind of as a side note, I would add as well considerations around the actual, you know, L2, whether it's a dedicated chain or whether it's one of the existing ones does have consideration because you know, right now it's a pain in the ass every time you've got to jump between a different chain. If you've then got to say fund a wallet to pay for renewals or something like that, these, it all starts to kind of add to the cognitive load, which I think all of us are pretty used to, but I think we've also got to think about the next sort of set of users as well there. Yeah, and it's a, I keep coming back to it's a, it's a funny thing because when we register our names, we're extremely time sensitive and then our names will sit around there with the same address associated with them for months or years, during which the latency of the finality period is completely irrelevant to us. Um, and yet we have to optimize the system for that initial user experience to a large degree, which is you know, an unfortunate truth of building this, I think. Hi, uh, there we go. Uh, got another question on uh, follow-up on user experience here. As we talk about increasing security or decreasing security for this uh, fi finalization on L2 and L1, what is the user specifically giving up on each of these queues? Uh, I mean, on the one axis is time. You know, waiting for, for L1 plus L2 finality will take anywhere from, uh, you know, two hours to a week, uh, depending on the roll-up. Um, and on the other axis is, uh, axis is the cost of an attack, basically. So at the one extreme, it's effectively impossible. Um, then you get into requiring coordination between a malicious gateway and block producers or a malicious gateway and the L2 sequencer. And then you get into territory where your, your guarantee is weak enough that a malicious gateway alone could propose you know, invalid blocks. And I think we're all of the consensus that that is too weak. And if we're doing that, we may as well just operate DNS servers, you know.
I think if there's a way we can petition things just so that new registrations resolve a lot faster than, you know, by or by default resolve very quickly, um, but that you can then opt into higher security as time goes on, um, then that would be really attractive. But I, I haven't personally been able to think of a, a good architecture for that. Um, but you know, that would be a natural progression because, you know, you almost sort of ossify your records as they get you know, as they go longer without changes, it would be good to be able to also guarantee a higher degree of security on them. Um, but I don't know whether there's a practical architecture that allows for that. So so my feedback on that is, I wonder if that is uh, actually a, a problem we should like offer uh, it for up for research, right? It's, it could be very, of economic value dependent. For example, I might not really care if it's I'm getting and, and sending airdrops, but if I'm sending, let's say, grants, right, maybe I'll care. And then the other way is to think of it in different contexts. For example, when it comes to like commit review, right, if everyone is rushing to get one good names, and maybe it doesn't really matter for the second one whether like how fin finalized it, it is because it, it's gonna finalize anyway. But for the commit to be confirmed, it uh, whoever gets the first uh, the commitment actually gets a rise. So that really matters for people, right? Another context that as more and more people are moving to use, let's say, sign in with ENS, sign in with Ethereum, they could actually get additional power outside of the chain for being able to resolve to that address. Let's say I happen to be a member of a, this organization and I'm giving rise to access the treasury fund through signing with Ethereum, and if the finality uh, delays, and then when I'm being trying to shut off the, the access to, let's say, if they're compromised, where there's attack to this person, then uh, having additional time would actually ex uh, increase the attack surface. So maybe maybe that's a combination of uh, security and uh, and social and economic research that needs to put in if we want to choose a proper default value or uh, approach. Uh, we're almost out of time, but anyone have any uh, any last thoughts they'd like for the whole room? All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for participating. We really um, appreciate your time, and we we'll hope to work with you more. I'm trying to get up. There's an ENS developers channel. Uh, if you're not in it uh, and you'd like to be to continue some of this conversation, maybe come up here, and I can make sure to add you. Lunch is being served, so if you're, I'm sure you're hungry, so you can go downstairs, grab some food, and if you have any other questions for, oh. Uh, oh, yeah. If you'd like to be in a group photo, please join us. Um, if you're a non, you can wear a mask. Uh, all right, thank you. <laughs>